I have to take care of some business tonight, and I thought I would do it this way, so that when the the emails or the letters or the posts or whatever come in, I have all the answers in one place. So I hope, because we serve a very smart God, that somehow, some way, this is really edifying and uplifting. If not, you're just going to get a lot of history and information that you probably already know, and a few surprises, I'm hoping. Speaking of how smart God is, I was sitting at home, and I was going, what do I do? I have an hour to kill before it's time to go. And uh, I really felt like the Holy Spirit said, why don't you buy some sunglasses? <laughs> because it's always good to have a spare if you're using them in your act. So I did, on the way here. When I went to go put on the real ones, they just snapped. <laughs> I just picked them up and they snapped. I didn't even pull on them and they snapped. And I was like, wow. That's it. That's, that, was, that was your uplifting testimony for, for the night. Uh, tonight I want to talk about the future of my ministry. What the plan is. But first, some history. I was converted. I was converted. I, I received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior in 1982. Uh, I was 19 years old, which makes me 30. And um, I had been performing my entire life. It was my plan to continue performing. I was in a hot LA punk band. We were recording our first record. But God had other plans for my life and intervened and I met Jesus, and for the first couple years of being a believer, I really thought I would be a Christian rock star one day. But Christian music was so horrible, and everywhere I went to play, people came up to me and said, God put you here to pick up where Keith Green left off. And Keith Green, this is where you're really careful about what you say, Keith Green was one of the most influential people in modern Christian music. But he was not necessarily a man I would want to emulate. And there's no discredit to him, but he was very popular in the Vineyard Churches. I was a, you know, part of a worship team in the Vineyard Churches, and people said, you have Keith Green's ministry, you have his mantle, you have the same anointing on you that Keith Green had on him, and the church needs that voice. And Keith Green sold billions of records, so maybe I shouldn't have argued so much, but he, he also did things like, in the middle of the concert, he would stand up and say, why are you all here? You should be out there serving the Lord. You should be out there reaching people. He said, you're pissing away 20 bucks to see me, and you should be out there ministering. I, so I guess I see some of the similarities of the way he addressed the people that supported him. But I really wanted to be a pastor. I really wanted the suit, the pulpit, the church. I really wanted that experience, and that's what I trained for. And, and in my 20s, which was just a couple years ago, I did start and pastor a church in Los Angeles, got married, had gaggle of children, and when my kid's mom took ill, I stepped down from ministry to take care of my family. And I never expected to be in ministry again, and, and I didn't really care, because I had learned through a pulpit ministry, even though I didn't really have a pulpit, but I, I learned through being the pastor that ministry happens wherever you are, whoever you are, and if you don't get that, you don't belong on a pulpit. If you can't minister at McDonald's, you should minister at the Crystal Cathedral. And so I was good. I figured I would continue to witness to people and share the Lord with people and, and continue on. And, and uh, But one night I went to sleep and I woke up and I knew I'd gotten my marching orders and God had somehow communicated to me 
that I was going to have a music ministry, which by then was the worst news I could have possibly have heard. Because my concept of music ministry and Christian music in general is it's excruciating. And someone like me, I'd be playing acoustic guitar and I'd sound just like Neil Diamond and it would be a fate worse than death. Well, God's funny and he's smart because he knew he was putting me on the most challenging road of my life. And the last thing I would ever say is what I was doing was boring. It was, it's been the most exciting thing I could have ever done. It's been the greatest thing I could have ever done. And I'm just going to move on before I sound like Oprah's last show. And, uh, <laughs> but I quit my amazing job as a teacher and followed the voice of the Lord in my life to my first record, which flopped miserably. But that's okay, because I went in to do my second record, and it flopped even more, and I lost all my friends. And then I went to record my third record, Does God Sleep, which was going to be the last thing I ever did. So I recorded what I really wanted to record. I recorded a very intense, uncomfortable record about real problems that real people have in the face of knowing the true and living God, meaning, how could God let this happen to me? The big question most people have. And it'd be great if that story ended with <clears throat> um, the record was a huge success because I had followed my heart, but no, that record tanked even more. My records failed so much more than the one previous. It made the one previous look like a success. And back in those days, I was, a, I was just wearing jeans and t-shirts and <clears throat> high top sneakers and I didn't feel I had anything to prove. I, I had lived through glam rock, punk rock, heavy metal, techno, industrial, new romantic, and I'd never once dressed up. I'd never once worn makeup. I'd never once pierced anything. I never once did anything. I don't think I even dyed my hair except once, you know, for a movie I did. And because uh, <clears throat> I was a real kid from Hollywood, I was the real deal. And the bands that I really admired the guy bands, the guys didn't do that, like um, The Clash, um, you know, they, they represented just being honest in their, their songs. So as a Christian artist, I was like, well, I'm going to just do this and be myself. And because God anointed me and called me to do this work, and I have such great songs, people are going to love me. And people didn't love me. People did not love me from the start. They disliked me from the start. Um, you can hear my first record on the internet and imagine people writing me telling me that's satanic. <laughs> you know, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. I showed them what satanic would look like. And uh, so, Does God Sleep was tanking horribly. It was just dying a slow, violent death. I couldn't get shows. I, I, nobody was booking me. I had nothing planned except to go back to, to work as a teacher. And... Uh, I got a call to do a Bikers for Christ concert in Flagstaff, and I went, well, there you go. That's the day you die. <laughs> That's it. That's when it happens. You go do the biker show, they hate you, and then they kill you. That's what happens. So I'm pretty weird. If I'm really nervous about something, I do something extreme that I'm more scared of doing, like... Um, eating some kind of food I would normally eat, or um, painting my house yellow. I've done that. I did that once. I started painting the house yellow about something I was disturbed about. And for the biker show, to celebrate my fear, I shaved my head into a mohawk, dyed it black, put on guy liner, black nail polish, black lipstick, and black leather, and combat boots. I went to the biker show. Hallelujah. I figured I'd show up, they'd laugh their asses off and send me home, and I wouldn't even have to sing. They liked me. They really liked me. And uh, I moved more CDs that day than I had in my entire music career up to that point. And they were raffling a, a motorcycle, and I got on the motorcycle to get my picture took. <laughs> and I went, <sighs> that's where it happened. Got my picture taken on a motorcycle all dressed up, got home, thought the 
picture was funny. I put it on my MySpace and I went to bed. Woke up the next morning to offers to play all over the world and thousands of downloads to my music. I had a career. I also had an image change. <laughs> and I've said it ever since. I backed myself into a fashion corner. <laughs> and I've lived there ever since. And, uh, and it was fine. Until I had to tell my kids, <laughs> hey, uh, Dad's had an image change. Like, we know, we saw MySpace. Thanks a lot, Dad. So, overnight, I went from nobody wants me to being booked two years in advance. Overnight. And overnight, I went from no one will return my calls to I don't have to make any. And overnight, I went to um, <clears throat> there's no money coming in and there was money coming in. And I realized that the bargain I had made with that was all that was on the inside was now going to be obvious on the outside. That I wasn't playing it safe by wearing jeans and t-shirts. I was playing, playing it straight. And not like the not gay straight, just straightforward, forthright, straight. But God had called me to let it all out. To let it all out. And all of a sudden, I, was, I had a career. I had a place. I had a, a, a niche. I had a plan. And fortunately, Don't Touch Me Anymore was on Does God Sleep. And, and that went viral. And it had, you know, tens of thousands of downloads. And, and it secured the fact that if I really was direct about who I was on the inside, that I could get away with anything. And I'd never felt more freedom in my entire life than God looking me in the eye and saying, I brought you to a place where you can get away with anything. <laughs> Please respect your stewardship here, <laughs> but you can do whatever you want. And fortunately, my next record was Real Man, because Real Man is the only pop-friendly record I've done and it had a couple songs that got some airplay. And what that did is it secured me forever that if I was willing to play for free, there would always be someone that would have me. So I knew I'd made it. I'd made it in the music business. I had arrived. So the minute I had achieved a goal that I had had my entire life, that I dreamt of as a kid when I was dancing around the foreigner, I realized I was officially bored, and I officially didn't care about what I was doing anymore. That it was just, I'd done it. I climbed the mountain, I got to the top, now I have to find a new mountain to climb. So I went and did a concert in Phoenix uh, when I lived in Nevada, and when I was driving back, this horrible song got stuck in my head that I had written in my 20s called Zombies. And it was the worst thing I've ever written. I still say it's the worst thing I've ever written. And the only thing worse than that was Real Man, but you know, Real Man gave me a, gave me a life. Um, so God bless everyone else's taste but mine. But zombies popped in my head, and I was like, what are you doing? Like teasing me? Like, you know, why are you? It's like God was playing me the song. And he goes, no, uh, it's going to be your next, next record. It'll be your next record, and it, you're, it's going to be the name of the record, it's going to be the song of the record, it's going to be the heart of your ministry from this day forward. And I went, have you heard it? It's like the stupidest song ever. And he goes, well, it needs new lyrics. It needs new lyrics. And driving home, Phoenix, uh, the Holy Spirit, and I rewrote Zombies, which was actually about a broken relationship back in the 20s, back in my 20s, which was in the 20s, and it became a song that was an attack on the church and how complacent it had become to embrace and enjoy difference in its members instead of judging it. 
And I became the guy who said, my ministry will from now on represent our differences and, and I will attack the church. I will come up against the church 